What's that? Do you know about Zingerman's? It's like a Ann Arbor cult. No. Well, no. really amazing deli, but beautiful baked goods. Oh. So there's chocolate cupcakes and really gorgeous fruit. Uh huh. Okay. Maybe after. Yeah. After. <laughs> You're going back to dinner after. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't think. Is there any? Is there anywhere I could get coffee? Next? Yeah. Yes. She's bringing up coffee. Oh yay! Okay. okay. Thanks. Thank you. We have a little bit. can't rid ourselves of it. So. Sure. Um, and I also want you to know that there'll probably be a slight exodus. Okay. People yeah, going to get their last time or so. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so just, yeah. Okay. Is that amazing? So good. Okay, good. Oh my God. It's crazy.
Oh, I have some. Thank you. probably open up my Twitter. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I have not gotten in the habit of Twitter at all. Person again. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm happy to be awesome. here. Yeah. yeah. And you're coming. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's great. That's great. Thanks for your chapter and oh, everything. Yes. Hope Thank Eric you didn't the... drive you crazy. <laughs> He's <laughs> very. He is so. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good at details. No, I yeah. think it improved the chapter for sure. So. Yeah. He did that to my chapter it's too. So <laughs> at first, I was like, Oh God. I know. Yeah, it's like, Eric, God, come on. <laughs> it is. He can't let it go. I know. So, yeah. But it's good. So thanks for that. Oh sure. sure. Oh, yeah. It's a great book. To I'm excited about it. Yeah, I think it's coming together. That's exciting. Yeah. That's exciting. Oh, to rain in people like me. I'm sorry. Oh, no, no. You're fine. You're fine. It's just like a lot, you know, back and forth. Really cool. No, but it was in great shape anyway. So, oh, well, something that was a further to go. So. Yeah. Thank you so much. I begged coffee. So. <laughs>
Yes, yes. So we're clearly not we're adjusted the, well. Yeah. And when we're teaching, it's hard, to it's hard too habits. because we, it's so weird and so trivial, but it's really hard. No, yeah, but when you and like so now have classes start on the hour, but they end at 50 minutes past. So instructors are also we're ending too not early. remembering they're supposed to end at 10. Yeah. Well, we just shifted our um, department meetings from 10 to 9, no, what did we do? Yeah, from 10 to 9.30, so we can end a half hour, or half hour earlier and have regular program meetings. And it, like, every week, it every time it throws me, every month, I'm just getting in my it's car too late. how those kind of things become, like, Habit, so habitual yeah. that mm -hmm. they're not easy to change. Mm -hmm. Nobody even completely knows why Michigan decided to change this after, who knows, forever. Because uh -huh. it doesn't make any difference. It's a 50-minute block anyway. Yeah, why right? did they do that? Yeah. So, or in our case, it's often two hours and 50 minutes. Right. It's not a different length. It's right. <laughs> right. It doesn't make much sense. Yeah. Maybe because it just was more transparent, because what would happen mm -hmm. is schedules would be scheduled to be mm -hmm. at, like, 3 o'clock, but they really began at 3.10. And no one, like, never said that. So I think they said, like, let's just do it. You know, let's miss the thing. Yeah. 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 So what they did was they said then classes end at 10 to 8. So that they can actually begin on the hour. Still need to copy the right. Yeah. It's okay. We're just all adjusting. Also, the thing about the online thing is that we get lots of people, even who are right in the building, interested yeah. to watch online. The talk I gave yesterday on Whitney, there were it was a good room, but then there were people. Yeah. So you, <laughs> there were people. I was teaching. So I got notes from people who I didn't see, and they were like, "Oh, I was watching it in my office." <laughs> yes yes this is the last week did you, you you all started right yeah that's why i was able to do this otherwise this would have been my first week of class yeah Uh, I mean, really, two. 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 Then Justice and I. No, it's what it's been. We could use more. We have a second biggest program. Um, and I mean, I, we hire a bunch of adjuncts. You know, such as. Oh, yeah. Math Ed. Um, even, I mean, that's one of the smaller programs. Science has. Um, one, two, yeah, science just has two also. Somebody who specializes in bio and someone who specializes in physics. Yeah. And Ben and I both actually, I mean, I'm actually not, I last couple years haven't been teaching social studies courses. I coordinate the program, but I've been teaching our doc courses and um, we have a ed, uh, culture and society EDD and a PhD, so yeah. teaching those instead. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're stretched. We could really use another social studies faculty person. So I'll introduce the seminar and then Deborah Great. will introduce you. Should I sit down? Or? Yeah, if you'd like. So welcome everyone here and those who are joining us online. Uh, my name is Simona Golden and I direct the streaming seminar series, Teaching Work Streaming Seminar Series. I want to welcome you all to the third seminar series of this academic year. It's focused on the theme, How Does Knowing Content Matter for Disrupting the Persistence of Oppression? Now, as you all know, this year we've been working together to explore the relationship between the special nature of knowing content in teaching and the work of seeing and hearing children's ideas with subject matter and supporting both their learning and their growth. We've invited a series of scholars this year to join us in considering, considering what is involved in knowing and using content in ways that enable teachers to select and design content, to know it in ways that allows them to open up what knowledge is and who gets to make it, to hear children's ideas, to disrupt deficit narratives, 
to recognize children's strengths and see potential and resources in families and communities, and to struggle with the canon in some authentic ways. And last, to explore how we can support our beginning teachers to learn content in ways that are intermeshed with the imperative to use teaching to disrupt racism. We know that patterns of racism and oppression can be reproduced or interrupted, depending on what content, content is selected for students' learning and also how it is opened up and related to the experiences that children bring into classrooms. We also know that even when our teacher candidates are committed to the disruption of oppression, that they can fail at their commitments when they don't understand content in ways needed so that they can hear their students, so that they can open up critical perspectives or to connect to students' communities and families. We've been really blessed this year to have begun this journey with Dr. Gloria Ladson Billings, who declared in her opening talk, we're not called to win, we're called to struggle. After saying that, she examined what the funding of race means for schools for, and for children. She argued that the curriculum is a site of contestation and helped us to see that how we teach explains the social funding of race and the imperative to interrogate hegemonic knowledge. After Dr. Ladson Billings, we welcome Dr. Marcel Haddix, who began her talk with a quote from James Baldwin. We are all our children. We will profit by or pay for whatever they become. Dr. Haddix helped us to see the importance of holding spaces for our students when they want to change the world. Talking about the violence that exists inside of classroom walls, she noted that teacher edu education itself is a site for racial violence. She interrogated with us the ways that we neutralize texts that might provide opportunities to talk about race and oppression, pretending that the classroom isn't a place to talk about power. I believe those ideas will come up um, today in Dr. Rubin's talk. In the end, Dr. Haddix concluded that we must reclaim English education for those who want to work towards social justice making room to think and to talk and to read about racial violence and residual trauma. She concluded that by saying that if writing is a tool to speak back to racial violence, then the role as teachers of writing is eminently important. Today, we really are so lucky to be joined by Dr. Beth Rubin, whose talk is entitled, Still Not Justice, Challenging, Structuring, and Recreating Social Studies Content to Disrupt Oppression. As the distinguished third speaker of this year's series, Dr. Rubin will consider the key questions I've just outlined, and she'll pick up on the threads and the conversations that we've had with our previous, previous speakers. We'll continue our tradition of active and considerable engagements, so we'll safeguard some time at the end of Dr. Rubin's talk to speak with each other. So that means I want you to keep track of your questions and your musings and the things that you want to bring up and air with each other. We'll invite you at the end to come up to the microphone and to ask your questions. If you're watching online, we want to hear your voice as well. And you could email your questions to twseminar at umich.edu. You could use our Twitter hashtag, at twseminar, or you could post to the Teaching Works Facebook page. You'll see us madly live tweeting um, with that same hashtag the whole time. And now I invite Deborah Ball to introduce our speaker. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's great to see all of you here, and we're excited about all of you who are watching online, and we're really very grateful, Dr. Rubin, that you're here with us today and excited about your talk. Um, in getting ready to introduce you, I was reflecting on my own history as an elementary school teacher, um, beginning to teach in the 1970s, and the school in which I taught had man a course of study as the curriculum. So pretty early in my teaching career, for those of you, we won't go into that today, but maybe some other points, some of you know about the history of that as one of many curricula that have been developed over time that infiltrated schools and had various controversies associated with them. But I remember learning to teach and how important curriculum was in shaping my ideas as a young teacher about what I should be teaching, about my students, about what teaching was, and that, among other curricula that my school district happened to have at that time, shaped many things that are still actually I think fermenting inside myself as an educator 
Um, but I also realized at the time, and even more so now, the more that I learn, um, how much the failure of my own education as a white woman shaped what I also understood about teaching and what I delivered as a social studies teacher. And so the title of the day is really important in thinking about how unwittingly as part of a system of systemic and reproductive racism, I, growing up in a society which had educated me in particular ways, then reproduced that in my own teaching, despite teaching with a fairly radical curriculum even at that time. So I'm, you know, as not a person who's gone on to focus on social studies in my work as a teacher, but more in math, it's useful to sometimes remind myself and others that I actually wasn't a math teacher, but um, was an elementary teacher, which is also itself an interesting challenge of what people do who in this country teach all these different things to so many different kinds of children and how we disrupt the kinds of education we've each had as we begin to learn to teach. We're really excited to have Beth Rubin here today. She's a professor at the Graduate School of Education at Rutgers University, which is the state University of New Jersey. Um, not everybody knows that, I think. And uh, there are many distinctive things about Beth's work, and I'll just mention a few so we can get into the session. But one thing that really um, is striking is the ways in which she uses school-based ethnographic study to come to understand the way young people see themselves or grow to see themselves as citizens and learners in the nested context that they're existing in classrooms and schools and communities, in their families and in society. And she pays particular attention to the ways in which civic identity takes shape um, in the local context where they're developing um, marked by, as I reflect on my own, historical and contemporary inequalities that persist in our society. She's a very collaborative researcher. She collaborates with educators to design curriculum, to design ways of teaching that are used to help change some of the fabric that I'm describing. And she develops approaches to teacher education also, which is key to the disruption factor as I reflect, is like how do we help teachers learn to think differently about what they've come to take for granted or what we've all come to take for granted through the ways in which education has miseducated so many of us. She's published in many of the leading journals. I know lots of you have read her work. Um, her most recent book, Making Citizens, Transforming Civic Learning for Diverse Social Studies Classrooms, which came out about six years ago, is designed to help priests and in-service social studies teachers integrate meaningful, critical civic learning into their practice, which is a challenge and it's interesting to think about the ways in which resources can help teachers to reconstruct what they think that they're doing. Um, some of her current projects include creating civically engaged districts, which is a socially transformative design project that's um, incorporating youth civic voice um, into practice, and she's investigating civic and historical learning in intentionally integrated schools in countries that are experiencing conflict. And I know that from um, learning from Michelle's work that that is a site where there's a lot for us to learn and to understand better. Um, her work has been supported by many foundations, including the Spencer Foundation, the Fulbright Foundation, the Overbrook Foundation, and she's done work that I think has pushed the boundaries of the way many of us come to think about both civics and social studies education and the connection to the problem space that Simona has designed for the series this year. We're really grateful to have you be one of our teachers and collaborators in this space this year. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Beth Rubin um, here to the University of Michigan today. Thank you so much, Beth. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everybody, and thanks so much for being here. Um, thank you for those very kind introductions. Um, I'm really excited to, um, to talk about this with all of you. I've um, been thinking about it since I got the um, incredible invitation from Deborah and Simona to come and, and uh, be part of this series. Um, and I was really excited when I got the invitation uh, by the challenge of pulling my thoughts together uh, to consider questions that for me as a teacher, educator, and researcher uh, in social studies education really are central to my concerns. So, how does knowing content matter for disrupting oppression? What's the relationship between advancing justice and the teaching of content? As soon as I accepted the invitation, I started seeing things that were relevant all over the place, all over my world listening to NPR while I was running, reading the newspaper, fiction, stories told by students in my class, movies, personal experiences. Started one of those little notes on my phone and I kept adding to it and I felt like I was making a lot of progress because I had this super long note on my phone. Um, and then I sent it to myself and I sat down to begin to map out the talk and I realized what an enormous task this was. Um, for social studies, the teaching of history and citizenship 
These questions are really central. Maybe they are the questions. So what I'm gonna attempt here today is to walk us through a consideration, an illustrated consideration, of the relationship between content and oppression in social studies, why it matters, and what we as educators might do about it. In this talk, I'm going to first consider how content is linked to oppression in the US social studies curriculum, and I'll use examples from two major areas, teaching about slavery and teaching about indigenous peoples, to illustrate this. I'll then consider what these ways of dealing with content mean for civic learning and identity. So how should we shape content? I'll share official approaches and then explore a few alternatives. And finally, we'll see some examples of how content can be recreated by young people as a means of disrupting oppression. So let's start with an example. Dear fourth grade families, read the letter home. The fourth grade students have recently begun a social studies unit on the study of colonial America and the American Revolution. During this unit, the students will be working on a long range project entitled My Colonial Character Journal. For this project, students will travel back in time, create a colonial character, and write about the events that took place during colonial times from the perspective of this colonial character. Since actually traveling back in time has not occurred yet, the students will be taking a virtual field trip back in time. They imagine the character they created has been given a journal to record his or her thoughts regarding life during colonial times. There are six journal entries the students will be required to complete. A seventh entry is optional for those wishing to extend their learning. Lisa, which is a pseudonym, an African-American fourth grader in a largely white upper middle class school district brought this assignment home to her parents this fall. As Lisa and her mother read through the assignment together, daughter turned to mother and said, mommy, wouldn't I have been a slave back then? I know this story because a student in my education and society class for EDD students is a colleague of Lisa's mom. In my class, I had given an assignment to write a vignette describing something they had seen or experienced in an educational setting that they were troubled by. We used those vignettes throughout the semester, examining them through multiple lenses as we delved into critical theory and education. This event, as you can imagine, was deeply disturbing for Lisa's mother, and she agonized over how to respond, both to her daughter and to the school. Lisa's mom brought this dilemma to her workplace, an educational opportunity fund uh, program at a public university, where she talked about it with her colleagues, including my student. They talked over how she should best approach the school so as not to anger the teachers and create an uncomfortable situation for Lisa. When my student first shared this story as her vignette, I was already thinking about this talk, and I asked her if Lisa's mom might be open to letting me share both the school's assignment and her response with others if I kept it all confidential, and she readily agreed. So I'd like to just spend a couple minutes um, and give us a chance to talk a little bit about this example. Um, and unfortunately, I have to keep our discussion really brief because I've created a kind of unreasonably long talk today. <laughs> um, but I really do want to start off with a little bit of engagement and just to think about, um, talk first to the person next to you about what strikes you in the assignment and in Lisa's response. Uh, and then we'll have a couple minutes to talk together. And if you, I uh, almost forgot to say this, if you are watching online, um, you can use the next couple minutes to jot down your ideas about what strikes you. And then if you'd like to email your ideas or use a Twitter, the Twitter hashtag, uh, or post to the Facebook page, you can contribute as well. So I'll go back to the assignment. So take a couple minutes and talk about it with your neighbor, about what, what strikes you.
Okay, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I'm going to call us back together and just to get a few of your ideas, your thoughts out there into the room. Uh, who would like to, oh, and I guess, Simona, they have to use the microphone? Yeah. Okay. Uh, someone want to get us started? Just to, whatever you're thinking, thank you. <laughs> My name is Paulina Frazier, and um, our group discussed how when we were just reading over this that um, it definitely follows a certain perspective of history, and it follows a very Eurocentric um, timeline of history, and I specifically pointed out on the day one assignment how it talks about the pretending to mm. journey from England to mm. the colony of New Jersey. Um, and of course, that's definitely not the only account <laughs> of how people got here. Yeah, yeah. So we were just, you know, considering how those other perspectives weren't taken into account and how this was kind of presented as the, um, you know, colonial history mm -hmm. of the Americas. Yeah. So. yeah, good points. Yeah. Other thoughts? Kim Hi, Lansom, Kim. and I would agree with everything Paulina said. I think um, a responsible teacher who is coming from looking at history, that this would not be an accurate representation of history from, for the reasons that Paulina mm -hmm. said. And then also I think that it doesn't, um, it doesn't allow the children to be critical mm -hmm in terms of their thinking about history from various vantage points and perspectives. Yeah. And then the last thing I would say is because the classroom is not diverse, um, I would, if I were to redo this, part of what I would do is have the students to be a part of various historical racial groups. Yeah, yeah. So even though I only have one African American, maybe I have one Native American, well, this group of five are actually right. my Native Americans. These, you know, it's one way to think about it. Um, yeah, yeah so. good redesign idea, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay, we'll take that and then I'm gonna so, forge um, onward. Our colleague Rebecca tweeted, <laughs> um, despite the emphasis on understanding perspective, there's only one perspective available <laughs> for kids to take yeah. in this. Excellent point. Yeah, yeah. Anybody have a burning comment to make before I move on? Okay. Um, where am I? I'll leave that up. So, so in this case, thank you for those really astute remarks. Um, in this case, the fourth grade curriculum was constructed without attention really to history itself. There is, of course, no version of colonial history in which there are no slave owners, enslaved people, or dispossessed indigenous people. There isn't, for that matter, a colonial history in which opportunities for white girls or for poor white girls and boys weren't sharply curtailed. The assignment leaves out a lot. But this is a curriculum for fourth graders, right? Should we be tackling those big issues, issues of justice, of white supremacy, with nine and 10-year-old students? So University of Texas at Austin scholars Anthony and Kefferlin Brown note that curriculum is about memory making or the way a nation imagines and shapes what people come to know about the past and present. What are students coming to know about the past and present through this assignment? What vision of what understanding of colonial history of US history are white students building by not learning about the experiences of African Americans at this time period? who continue their accumulation of privilege from a history that centralizes whiteness and generally avoids discussion of race? What might African-American students be learning from this assignment? That the story of enslaved Africans is not central to the American story, that it is legitimate to present a history that invisibilizes race? As Brown and Brown note, the degree to which a young person is able to learn about race from the school curriculum will inform his or her understandings of race, both its significance and impact in the present. Um, the racial, this racial knowledge informs the present day sociological imagination of students about their own place in a racialized society, whether they are part of a dominant racial group or a historically underrepresented group. The invisibilization of the black experience is not limited to this assignment. 
Scheer notes that despite recent movements to address social justice issues and the one-sided nature of US history textbooks, social studies scholarship routinely finds that Euro-American voices dominate textbook and content standards. And this has civic consequences, which I will elaborate later. So in the end, Lisa's mom wrote this letter. Good morning. I wanted to send you a note of concern regarding the colonial character journal assignment recently given. In reviewing the assignment, my husband and I are extremely concerned about the journaling that requires Lisa to go back in time and discuss her life during the colonial period. As I'm sure you're aware, African Americans were slaves during the colonial period. In fact, slavery existed in every colony. Slave labor was used for farming and tobacco cultivation. Slaves lived on plantations and were subjected to inhuman treatment. Children were brutalized and ripped away from their parents. These are the things Lisa would be asked to revisit and reflect on through this assignment. Thus, we hope you can understand why we would be concerned about Lisa being asked to journey back to that time and to journal about her experiences. The narrative of her, of her experiences as a young nine-year-old during the colonial era would include her life as a slave. We cannot abide with Lisa being asked to revisit such a painful time in our nation's history, a time when her ancestors were treated as property and subjected to chattel slavery. While we support our daughter learning about American history, the good, the bad, and the ugly, we remain concerned that assignments of this sort can be harmful to a child when it's not a true reflection of history. While the assignment may be asking Lisa to, quote, pretend to be someone else in history traveling back in time, she already has had experiences rooted in history. During the summer entering third grade, Lisa attended a summer program. During summer camp at, the sc at school, Lisa was called a derogatory name by a fellow camper who was also a fellow classmate at school. Because she was taught at home, as much as you can talk with an eight-year-old about African-American history, she knew enough to know that she should not be called this and immediately told the teacher. The incident was investigated accordingly and an outcome was rendered by the school board. Our daughter had some awareness of history to know this derogatory name was unacceptable. Thus, we have to continue to educate our daughter about the honest version of history because she already has experiences that speak to its ugliness. We recognize that teaching about American history is hard work. Explaining this country's long and violent history and helping students to understand how the present relates to the past is hard. Still, we cannot in good conscience support this activity or allow Lisa to participate. We're happy to meet with you uh, to discuss our concerns. So in some ways, this letter, I think, holds everything that I'd like to share in this talk. Some things I'd like to point out. Lisa's parents give a more detailed and accurate view of the time period than does the school assignment. They also describe their child's and black Americans in general direct, personal, and painful connection to this part of history, a connection that cannot be erased, should not be ignored, and needs to be considered and treated with care and sensitivity. Then they make the connection between past and present, between individual experiences and institutional racism, between slavery, white supremacy, and contemporary racism. They call out the danger in presenting a version of history that elides white supremacy, a danger we've experienced in the recent political moment. Another thing that really strikes me is the extent to which Lisa's parents are the ones who are truly educating their daughter about race, racism, and history, and how important it was for Lisa that they had done so. School did not equip her to understand or respond to her direct experience of racism. Her parents' teaching did. Finally, Lisa's mother puts into words the primary problematic at the center of this talk. We recognize that teaching about American history is hard work. Explaining this country's long and violent history and helping students to understand how the present relates to the past is hard. So let's consider another example. Recently, two reporters spent several months researching the history and financing of Confederate monuments and sites. This is a photo of a school tour of the Jefferson Davis Home and Presidential Library in Biloxi, Mississippi. Jefferson Davis was a cotton farmer, a slaveholder, and the one and only president of the Confederate States from 1861 to 1865. And the photo is of uh, Beauvoir, Davis's post-war home. Um, so this is a school tour of this federally financed historical site. The reporters Palmer and Wessler shared that after discussion of the window treatments and oil paintings, the other visitors left. And we asked the guide what she could tell us about slavery. Sometimes children ask about it, she said. I want to tell them the honest truth, that slavery was good and bad. While there were some hateful slave owners, she said, it was good for the people that didn't know how to take care of themselves, and they needed a job, and you had good slave owners like Jefferson Davis who took care of his slaves and treated them like family. He loved them. 
In the tour guide's version of history, which she shared with her young visitors, slavery was not an institutionalized system that was the foundation of contemporary economic and political inequality, but rather an arrangement between individuals that was really not that bad, with potential for violence and brutality certainly, but sometimes not, uh, beneficial, and certainly not contextualized as part of a larger system uh, of the exchange of people for goods, which over the course of three centuries wrenched 12 million Africans from their homelands with devastating consequences, death, disease, generations of servitude for them and their descendants reshaping the world and human history in the process. The defanged version of history given by the tour guide shows up in textbooks as well. Oh, consider, for example, this map in a Texas social studies book noticed in 2015 by Kobe Buren, a 15-year-old freshman. Kobe saw this map with its captions and immediately texted a photo to his mom, Ronnie Dean Buren, and here's her analysis, which she posted on social media. Good morning. Um, yesterday I posted a picture of my son. Uh, he sent me a, I guess, an image from his history book about Africans coming over as workers. And so a lot of people asked me about the book and who the publisher was and so he has a copy of the book at home uh, we are in Texas um, and so this is a part of the Texas textbook adoption um, so I'm going to show you the book and then there's just an interesting section where they sort of place the map I think it's interesting so the book is I'm gonna turn the camera around the book is uh, this book by McGraw Hill this is world geography you see that's the uh, the publishers McGraw Hill then on the inside of the book which is a little scary to me. You have all of these people who are seemingly wise people. All of them have that little PhD behind their name. And these are the academic consultants for this book. And then here are the reviewers and consultants. Um, I'll leave that on there for a little while in case y'all wanna find these people. Got some t plenty of Texas people who approve this book. Yeah, yeah. And then there's the Texas Advisory Board as well. So again, these are all people, all professionals who said yes to this book. So the section that we find uh, that map in is, let's see, it's on page 126, is under this section called Patterns of Immigration. Patterns of Immigration. You see it says one of the defining attributes of the United States is that it is largely a country of immigrants and their descendants. About 13% of the people in the United States are foreign born, while Native Americans, Alaska Natives, and Native Hawaiians make up 2% of the population. The remaining population is descended from immigrants. Immigrants, yeah, that, that word matters, immigrants. The Atlantic slave trade between the 1500s and the 1800s brought millions of workers from Africa to the Southern United States to work on agricultural plantations. So it is now considered immigration. And these are some other sections that sort of talk about the pattern of immigration. This section here in particular talks about uh, English and European peoples, many of whom came as indentured servants to work for little or no pay. So they say that about um, English and European people, but there is no mention of Africans working as slaves or being slaves. It just says we were workers. So um, that's for you all who asked about this book. Again, it is World Geography by McGraw-Hill. So um, McGraw-Hill Education issued an apology and promised to change the text in upcoming editions. With more than 100,000 copies of the textbook already in the hands of Texas school children, the company offered to, quote, replace the textbook, provide a sticker with the rewritten caption to cover up the old one, or supply a lesson plan free of charge to teachers on cultural sensitivity. Black students, Ashley Woodson writes, may have contentious relationships with how slavery is presented in classrooms and textbooks. So let's return to a minute uh, to the to the tour of Beauvoir, and this is uh, apparently Jefferson Davis and his family and uh, a named woman. Um, so return to the tour that we started this example with. How did the African-American children and their families who came to tour the Davis home feel about the experience? Palm and uh, Wessler write 
that during the fall muster at Beauvoir, the Jefferson Davis home, we met Stephanie Brazel, a 39-year-old African-American Mississippian who had accompanied her daughter, a fourth grader, on a field trip. It was Brazel's first visit. I always thought it was a place that wasn't for us, she said. Brazel had considered keeping her daughter home, but decided against it. I really do try to keep an open mind. I wanted to be able to talk to her about it. Brazel walked the Beauvoir grounds all morning. She stood behind her daughter's school group as they listened to reenactors describe life in the Confederacy. She waited for some mention of the enslaved or of African Americans after emancipation. It was like we were not even there, she said, as if slavery never happened. I was shocked at what they were saying and what wasn't there, she said. It's not that Brazel, who teaches psychology, can't handle historic sites related to slavery. She can, and she wants her daughter, now 10, to face that history too. She's taken her daughter to former plantations where the experience of enslaved people is part of the interpretation. She has to know what these places are, Brazel said. My grandmother, whose grandparents were slaves, she told stories. We black people acknowledge that this is our history. We acknowledge that this still affects us. There are around 700 Confederate monuments in the South. They're not markers for historic events uh, and people made at the time. They were explicitly created and funded by Jim Crow governments, Southern governments that passed state and local laws enforcing racial seg uh, segregation, reestablishing white supremacy after the Reconstruction period, laws which were enforced up until 1965. The monuments were created to pay homage to a slave-owning society and to serve as blunt assertions of dominance over African Americans, and they were strongly opposed at the time of their creation. They're still being publicly supported. Over the past 10 years, at least 40 million in taxpayer funds have gone to support Confederate monuments, statues, homes, parks, museums, libraries, and cemeteries, and to Confederate heritage organizations. At the Confederate Memorial Park in Tampa, Florida, the historical marker proclaims a commitment made in 1906, 40 years after the end of the Civil War, to the vindication of the cause for which we fought, which included the perpetuation of those principles which he loved and which you love also, ending with the postscript injunction, remember, it is your duty to see that the true history of the South is presented to future generations. As Stephanie Brazel pointed out, however, this is our history. We acknowledge that this still affects us. This still affects us. For me, those words are the siren call for the creation of a relevant, meaningful curriculum that connects past to present, painful past to painful present. Recent pain and protest echo past pain and protest. There is a past and present that calls out for understanding and explanation, and we ignore and paper over that at our peril. So I want to offer one more curricular example in this area, uh, a set of math problems given to third grade students in Norcross, Georgia, not in 1912, but rather in 2012, as part of an attempted interdisciplinary connection with the social studies unit on Frederick Douglass, the illustrious and formidable African-American social reformer, abolitionist, orator, writer, and statesman who became a national leader of the abolitionist movement after his escape from slavery uh, in 1838 speaking and writing widely and to great acclaim until his death in 1895. So these are uh, the, the math problems given out as homework. Frederick had six baskets filled with cotton. If each basket held five pounds, how many pounds did he have altogether? If Frederick got two beatings per day, how many beatings did he get in one week, in two weeks? Each tree had 56 oranges. If eight slaves picked them equally, then how much would each slave pick? What? is going on here. King and Woodson point out that not only are textbook descriptions of slavery narrow, but they also typically focus on the subjugation of black bodies while ignoring black agency. And indeed, I shared this example with my husband. He'd just finished reading a biography of Frederick Douglass, and he wondered aloud why, if they wanted to make a math problem related to Douglass, why didn't they pose a question like, if Douglass traveled to five countries and gave seven speeches in each, how many speeches did he make? Or something far more reflective of the man. This formulation, the way these problems are written, sh shields whites from responsibility, normalizes racialized violence. Leonardo and Porter use the concept of educative psychic violence to describe the negative effects of conversations about race that minimize or ignore the significance of racism. Brown and Brown examined fifth and eighth grade textbooks for depictions of racial violence, which they found to be limited and underanalyzed, disconnected from larger analyses of racism and white supremacy, uh, and to the larger structural and institutional ties that supported and subsequently benefited from those actions. This leaves us unable to grapple with and historicize contemporary racial violence. 
or I should say, we are unable to do this in school. It's being done elsewhere by young people across the country as they make connections between history, structure, and violence. Shouldn't social studies content address this? What is the relationship between content and oppression? Let's go back to the original My Colonial Character assignment. On day three, students are assigned a journal entry. Here it is. Clash of cultures, colonists and Native Americans. Their characters are now 11 years old and over time have noticed some similarities and differences between the colonists and the Native Americans. After reading about the Native American way of life, students are asked to compare and contrast both cultures. In this example, Native Americans and colonists are framed as two, quote, cultural groups with similarities and differences. Subsalian and Scheer note that attempts at multicultural approaches to elementary social studies education remain what they call colonial blind, a play on the term colorblind that typifies the way that social studies tends to handle issues of race. These approaches ignore notions uh, of tribal sovereignty and self-determination, the actual legal status of tribes as separate nations in relationship through treaty agreements with the government of the United States and the context of historical and continued colonization in which sovereign Native American nations were dispossessed. In the assignment, in contrast, Native Americans are framed, they're explicitly named, actually, as a cultural group, not a sovereign nation. The assignment asks students to perform a compare-contrast to create a balanced depiction of a relationship that was anything but balanced and certainly cannot be defined as centrally a clash of cultures, but rather as a struggle between two nations with quite unequal power characterized by deception. Subsalian and Scheer note that too often social studies educators disregard the unique government to government relationship between indigenous nations and the federal government, casting tribal federal political relationships in inaccurately as racial relationships, or in this case, as cultural encounters. Indigenous people are generally presented in the curriculum as belonging to the distant past. Scheer and colleagues studied how indigenous people are represented in state US history standards, finding almost every reference to native peoples to be in state standards that were related to time periods before 1900. As the colonial character assignment hints, the theme of cooperation followed by conflict dominates the depiction of native people's relationships with Euro-Americans. The westward expansion theme that follows the early cooperation to conflict theme then positions indigenous people as temporary barriers in the way of American progress. In many state standards, westward expansion is the end of the story of native peoples. The conquest and physical destruction of native peoples and lands is framed as inevitable and disconnected from enduring systems of oppression. After westward expansion, Indigenous people no longer figure significantly in state standards. 17 states contain, contain no mention at all of indigenous people after 1900. And although some academics estimate that approximately 20 million indigenous people may have died in the years following the European invasion, up to 95% of the population of the Americas due to disease and warfare, genocide is only mentioned in relation to indigenous peoples in the standards of one state, Washington state. Federally sanctioned violence against Native people, such as the 1862 execution in Mankato, Minnesota of 38 Dakota Indians by the U.S. government, the largest mass execution in U.S. history, do not appear in textbooks or state standards. Journalist John Wiener writes that Minnesota was a new frontier state in 1862 where white settlers were pushing out the Dakota Indians, also called the Sioux. A series of broken peace treaties culminated in the failure of the United States that summer to deliver promised food and supplies to the Indians, partial payment for their giving up their land to whites. Acting in self-defense, the Dakota rebelled, killing 490 white settlers. They were executed under orders from President Lincoln. Wiener continues, Abraham Lincoln's, uh, President Lincoln's treatment of defeated Indian rebels against the United States stood in sharp contrast to his treatment of Confederate rebels. He never ordered the executions of any Confederate officials or generals after the Civil War, even though they killed more than 400,000 Union soldiers. All of this leaves little room for students to develop an understanding of Native peoples that would help them to make sense of contemporary events such as the 2016 Dakota Access Pipeline protests led by the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe. The tribe's position is that pipeline violates their treaty rights, which guarantee them undisturbed use and occupation of res reservation lands. Acting as a sovereign nation, in 2015, the tribe passed a resolution stating that the Dakota Access Pipeline poses a serious risk to the very survival of our tribe. These very questions of sovereignty are obs obscured by the clash of cultures frame. 
So with these two examples in mind, I want to return to the original questions. How does knowing content matter for disrupting oppression? What is the relationship between advancing justice and the teaching of content? And I want to suggest that there's no such thing as knowing content in social studies. Content is always shaped and framed. It's always deeply political, even when it's adamantly apolitical. It's intimately connected to people's lives, even when it's most assiduously disconnected. It's felt intimately and distinctly and is closely related to oppression, to liberation, and to understanding. I want to play a little. That here. is the story of this country. The story that has brought oh. me to the stage tonight. Get it to the beginning. The story of generations of people who felt the lash. Hmm. That is the story of this country. The story that has brought me to this. Anybody know how to get us an embedded video to play from the beginning? Yeah, that makes it go back. Yeah. Sorry, folks. I was trying it out before, so I played a, ah, there it is. But where's the, oh, I just drag it. Perfect, okay. Great, yes. That nope. is the story or maybe, of this country. Maybe that is the beginning. The story that has brought me to the stage yeah, tonight. The story of generations of people who felt the lash of bondage the shame of servitude, the sting of segregation, but who kept on striving and hoping and doing what needed to be done so that today I wake up every morning in a house that was built by slaves. And, and, and I watch my daughters, two beautiful, intelligent black young women, playing with their dogs on the White House lawn. And, be and because of Hillary Clinton, that is the story of this country. Okay, so, um, so in her keynote address to the 2016 Democratic National Convention, First Lady Michelle Obama said, I wake up every morning in a house that was built by slaves. And you heard the reaction, just an overwhelming reaction. She received a standing ovation from the crowd and both acclaim and reprobation on social media where Rush Limbaugh compared slavery to a husband cheating on his wife uh, and said the Obamas needed to get over it. Uh, while Bill O'Reilly contributed that slaves that worked there were well fed and had decent lodgings provided by the government. But what I, I want to, think more about the response that she got. Clearly she struck a chord, and this is just a little bit of the love she got on social media for what she said. History itself hadn't changed, but by voicing her intimate emotional connection to the enslaved people who were fully and problematically part of this nation's creation, listeners felt the shock of understanding the dissonance of the contradiction and the ramifications of acknowledging the humanity of the enslaved peoples through whose forced labor this country was literally constructed. As Choctaw Cherokee scholar Francis Raines wrote, the dilemma is how to teach about core values such as freedom, liberty, and justice for all in a country that has a continued legacy of oppression and intimidation within its own boundaries. This is the challenge of oppression and content. And this brings me into more familiar territory, the focus of my research, uh, youth civic identity, and how young people come to see themselves in relation to the nation. Woodson noted that history textbooks deeply inform students' understandings of citizenship and democracy. She writes about black students' contentious relationships with texts about slavery, and certainly the examples I shared earlier highlight the way that school-based and educative framings of history set up particular versions of the nation's past that center whiteness and otherized Native peoples, African Americans, and other groups that are marginalized within the national story. Chandler and Branscombe call this white social studies that protects white dominant narratives and sidesteps discussion of institutionalized racism. This is a social studies that, as King and Chandler put it, fails to prepare students for a racially based citizenship existence in the US. I'll elaborate on this. 
In my own research and that of many others, we've explored the ways that students' day-to-day -day experiences, their lived citizenship experiences, shape their understanding of what it means to be part of the US. 15 years ago, at an urban middle school, students engaged in a lively discussion of the Pledge of Allegiance. Amber said, we are the one nation under God, one nation. But Jessica responded, when the Pledge of Allegiance says under God, it can't actually say that and expect people to pledge allegiance to the flag because there's other races that really don't believe in God. So if you don't believe in God, why would you pledge allegiance to the flag that states under God? You won't. It's well, Angelica said, interrupting, while well, me and her were discussing, she said that it's not one nation because of segre, like we had segregation, all this stuff, all this hate. But you're not pledging to the people in America, you're pledging to America itself. This brief snippet of classroom conversation shows these students' interest in and engagement with complex civic questions. Who is the one nation invoked in the pledge? Does our nation's history of segregation and all this hate provide a challenge to this notion? Can all Americans be expected to agree to a pledge that invokes belief in a deity? What about those other races who don't believe in God? Can they be expected to make the same pledge? Although quantitative measures of civic attainment consistently rank low-income students of color behind their white and more affluent peers, Amber, Jessica, Angelica, and their classmates, African-American and Latino eighth grade students at a middle school in a low-income uh, area, energetically pursued such questions for over two hours, leaving the room reluctantly and still talking. Students' civic knowledge and engagement are frequent subjects of inquiry for researchers from political science, education, developmental psychology, and other disciplines. Measures of civic learning have been administered to large cohorts of students, some repeatedly over the course of decades. The result is a wealth of data and analysis, an impressive body of research that documents students' civic achievement, or more aptly, their lack thereof, over time. With few exceptions, this body of literature is rooted in the idea that civic knowledge is a set of content and skills that can be given by teachers to students in a classroom setting. And civic engagement is measured by whether students say that they intend to vote once they are 18 or if they read newspapers or watch news on TV. Using these measures, young people come up lacking and students of color most lacking of all. But as the discussion between these students shows, such measures do not capture the depth and complexity of young people's feelings and analyses of civic life. Over 15 years ago, I began a line of research to investigate young people's relationship to the concept of citizenship across a variety of contexts. Over and over, I found larger social forces and students' day-to-day -day experiences in school framed and shaped young people's civic identities, their sense of connection to and participation in a, in a um, civic community. Zaria, African-American eighth grader, uh, who her quote contains the phrase I used as the title for the talk, explaining why she didn't think she, she should have to say the pledge, said, I don't think I have to pledge to a flag to show honor for my country when the words that we say are not true. One nation under God, well, we are under God but I don't feel like we're all one nation because some people still do segregate and there's still not justice, liberty and justice for all people. Young people's daily experiences powerfully shape their civic identities. Acknowledging this is the key to creating a meaningful and useful social studies. So how then do we structure content to engage with young people's pressing situated concerns concerns rooted in their lives, both as individuals and members of groups that are deeply connected to national history in ways which, as I discussed earlier, are not adequately engaged in social studies classrooms. I'd like to share a different approach. It was the day after the Ferguson grand jury declined to indict police officer Darren Wilson in the shooting death of Michael Brown. My students came into the classroom asking me about it before I even got a chance to say anything, said Nicole Cooper, social studies teacher at an urban high school in New Jersey. That same day, Sine Wright Wilkins, students at her urban Virginia high school, contacted her through social media before school began, asking if they could talk about the verdict in her social studies class. Coming to their teachers with the desire to discuss and begin to make sense of events that had touched them deeply, these students expected their social studies classrooms to provide this space. In response to her students' requests, Ms. Cooper reshaped her day's lesson. In the middle of a unit on the Constitution, she decided to dedicate the class period to student consideration of whether Michael Brown and the protesters' constitutional rights had been violated. Ms. Wright Wilkins asked her students to write in their journals and share their feelings about law enforcement. They're supposed to be there for protection, a student shared, but I have never felt protected by the police. 
When asked by her students to express her own feelings on the subject, Ms. Wright Wilkins demurred, later explaining, I want them to find their own opinions. The slide that I'm showing there uh, is a mural made by another teacher's class, Shauna Stein from uh, Suburban High School, who after the Ferguson verdict had her class read Nicol uh, Nicholas Kristoff's When Whites Don't Get It series and then asked them to create a visual response. This nine foot by six foot mural was hung in the hallway to share with the school. It's titled The Race Race. These students came to their social studies teachers anticipating that they would be able to use their classrooms to share feelings and discuss events of direct and personal importance. Their teachers, two African American and one white, built on these desires, creating discussion, writing, and analytical activities that allowed the students to contextualize their own feelings and experiences and con connect them to larger historical, social, and political themes. Perhaps these seem like obvious maneuvers. However, we could also imagine teachers responding that there's not time to discuss these events, that the day's lesson on the Bill of Rights needed to be completed, or that opening up discussion of students' feelings about law enforcement was too risky. There's a curriculum to get through. There are standards to meet. There are student growth, growth objectives that must be attained. The norms and conventions of classrooms are not neutral. They shape learning in particular ways, reflecting the structures and perspectives of particular people and places. And how is learning typically structured within social studies classrooms? This is one of my favorite pictures. <laughs> um, I'll share some insights that students have shared with me over the years. All we did was watch movies, handouts, dittos, remarked Juan, a student at an urban high school, describing his social studies class. Teachers just give you the book, read out of it, do the work, that's it, reflected Sarah, student at a middle class suburban school. The teachers don't teach, they'll give us a worksheet and we'll have to read it and then just answer the questions, concurred Sean, a student at a different suburban school. These comments, a few of many similar sentiments expressed by public high, schools, high school students that I've interviewed over the years, hint at how classroom social studies is frequently experienced in the United States and are consistent with other research. Multiple studies describe a field dominated by lecture, memorization, textbook-driven instruction, and worksheets. Despite a wealth of evidence about the necessity of discussion and, relevant, uh, discussion and relevance for effective civic learning, studies uh, report that little discussion occurs in social studies classrooms. Even teachers who claim that they use discussion are often confusing it with question and answer and recitation. In a recent poll, 35% of students surveyed said that teachers lectured most in their social studies classes, the highest percentage for all subjects. Wolk writes, not allowing students to engage in open discussion on important issues and topics is the most detrimental intellectual void in schools. Or as student Peter told me, it's just lectures, 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 and it gets boring after a while, so you don't really remember. So what's the official approach to structuring content in social studies? Although educators, researchers, and policymakers, and, and the general public have argued about the purpose of social studies for generations, most people would probably say that social studies is the same as history. So if you look at the standard sequence of courses found in most middle and high schools, U.S. high schools uh, usually require one to two years of world history, one to two years of U.S. history, with some requiring shorter courses in government and economics. Middle school curricula commonly include ancient history and U.S. history. Some require state history. Although the U.S. has a decentralized educational system in which state standards vary widely in terms of detail, organization, framing, and quantity in their requirements for social studies, the emphasis on history is consistent nationally. Despite the frequent use of the term social studies in the titles of various state standards, the 2011 National History Education Clearinghouse reports history remains at the center of the social studies curriculum. In New Jersey, where I live, train social studies teachers and send my children to public school, for example, the suggested sequence for high school social studies is framed historically down to suggested time periods. In California, that's on the left. In California, on the right, um, while economics and government do receive one semester each in students' senior year of high school, U.S. history, including California history, is the focus of social studies in grades four, five, eight, and 11, and world history is the focus in grades six, seven, and 10. History eclipses the other social studies topics by a factor of seven to one. This all seems rather straightforward. Social studies is history, and history is the study of what's happened in particular time and places, easily divided into time periods and locations, as the examples, uh, these examples show. But, of course, as I've spent the first part of this talk exploring, there's nothing simple about it. 
The content of an approach to the history curriculum at the heart of social studies education has long been controversial. Disputes take place over, among other things, the role of facts and chronology, the nature of perspective, how the economy is described, how the past is interpreted in relation to issues of justice, whether to emphasize individual rights or the community good, how to present dissent and activism, which historical figures to emphasize, how to discuss the negative aspects of, historical fi of heroic figures, and how to present the contributions of particular groups. Battles over content and approach often fall out along ideological lines with school boards, elected officials, and local citizens accusing districts of endorsing curricula that promote particular political perspectives. In, uh, and in the past several years, debates have raged over the content of the US history curriculum. So uh, in 2010, for example, the Texas State Board of Education mandated the use of history and economics textbooks that, quote, place more importance on the accomplishments uh, and efforts of Republicans. In, in Arizona that same year, state legislators spoke against the teaching of ethnic studies in the state's public schools, and Governor Brewer signed a law aimed to end the courses. In Denver in 2014, the Jefferson County School Board proposed eliminating U.S. history texts that did not promote, quote, respect for authority, precipitating a walkout of 700 high school students. So I guess they really did need that. <laughs> they really did need to change their textbook. Um, curricular tinkering can be very minute. Uh, so you can see on the right-hand side in Texas, uh, the State Board of Education created, parsed, approved, and mandated a list of 204 names of historical figures to be included in the state social studies uh, curriculum, going so far as to stipulate the exact grade level at which they were to be taught. Social studies is a contested space with different interests attempting to shape students' national identities and historical understandings by directing teachers' curricular content choices. So what do our professional organizations and social studies tell us about content? The National Council for the Social Studies has described our subject in this very complex manner. It's the integrated study of the social sciences and humanities to promote civic competence, integrating multiple disciplines, anthropology, archeology, span economics, geography, history, law, philosophy, political science, psychology, religion, and sociology, as well as appropriate content from the humanities, mathematics, and national sciences. Uh, into a coordinated and systematic study resulting in knowledge of uh, and involvement in civic affairs. This expansive definition calls for the coordinated and systematic integration of up to 14 different subject areas. The new C3 framework uh, for social studies stacks preparation for college and career on top of the NCSS's traditional commitment to preparing young people for citizenship. The framework's a masterwork of integration, weaving together all of the major social studies disciplines, the 10-part English language arts common core standards for reading and writing and history social studies, and a four-part action research sequence. There are 31 tables mapping out the connections between subjects and skills. This is an impressive synthesis that prevents social, presents social studies teachers with an overwhelming task. Yet the new NCSS C3, despite its commendable focus on civic inquiry, is basically raceless. In the 110-page document, I found four references to race, all of which were definitional. As Chandler and McKnight put it, no overt statement about race or racism is made in the standards that govern and organize the social studies. So Chandler suggests that social studies teachers need something he calls racial pedagogical content knowledge. Social studies teachers racial knowledge and how it influences content and pedagogical choices. King and Chandler suggest that racial pedagogical content knowledge in social studies teacher education be based on Pollock's four principles of anti-racist education. Rejecting false notions of human difference, acknowledging lived experiences shaped along racial lines, learning from diverse forms of knowledge and experience, and challenging systems of racial inequality. This would, as King and Chandler put it, add the layer of race to the teaching of concepts like democracy and government, which would allow teachers and students to see beyond the neutral language of institutions to uncover the lived realities that these macro structures inflict on people of color. Yet social studies teachers are still left with the daunting task of structuring content, doing so in a way that's cognizant of the links between co content and oppression, indeed, that has potential to create critical consciousness, to liberate. It's a challenging task. James Lowen, 
author of the classic 1995 Lies My Teacher Told Me, in his 2009 book, Teaching What Really Happened, writes about forests, trees, and twigs as a way of thinking about how to determine and select what is meaningful from what is peripheral to construct a more uh, engaging and thought-provoking US history curriculum. The traditional curriculum, he argues, in its attempt to cover, cover everything, reveals very little of importance. He dubs this a twig curriculum, made up of hundreds upon hundreds of dates, facts, and events, or twigs. Lowen writes, as a professor who specializes in teaching first year courses, I can guarantee that by the time they enter college, most students who are taught US history the usual way have forgotten everything except that World War I preceded World War II. <laughs> The goal, he writes, is to help students uncover the past rather than cover it. Instead of teaching the book, teachers must develop a list of 30 to 50 topics they want to teach in their US history course. Every topic should excite or at least interest them. What meaning might it have to students' lives? These topics would be the trees. They organize the twigs, facts, dates, figures that students are to recall. Lowen recommends that teachers select these trees, the essential topics of US history, by considering why they want students to know uh, what they're teaching and how it connects to the present. About how to select these trees, Lowen writes, no list can be completely idiosyncratic. If it omits the making and use of the Constitution, it's an incompetent list. If it does not include the Civil War and its impact, it's an incompetent list. But must it include, for example, the removal of the five so-called civilized tribes from the Southeast, the Trail of Tears of the Choctaws, Cherokees, Chickasaws, Creeks, and Seminoles? My list would. But a Minnesota teacher revealed to me that hers wouldn't. She'd rather teach the Dakota War or Sioux Uprising of 1862, which happened right in her part of Minnesota. She had a point. But at some point, every list must include the taking of the land from its first possessors, or it can't be competent. These essential topics should be selected for their ability to illuminate the continuing major themes of US history, what Lowen dubs the forests. For Lowen, these forests are areas of enduring concern. He identifies the following, these 10 forests. And if we look at these, we see how many, actually all, relate to oppression and justice. If a tree cannot be connected to one of these forests, if it cannot be used to pursue the key question, what are the implications of this topic for us today? Why does it matter? Then, as Lowen puts it, maybe it should be chopped off the list of topics. Get it? <laughs> So Lowen's, uh, Lowen's themes relate directly to and actively upend the oppressive use of content that we discussed earlier. In distinguishing between twigs, trees, and forests, Lowen gives us a way of structuring a curriculum that puts emphasis on big, enduring questions that connect past to present in ways that disrupt oppression. In another approach to structuring content to disrupt oppression in social studies, I worked with teachers to refashion the US history curriculum to engage young people directly with civic questions that are both timely and relevant to their lives uh, outside school. And it's the book that uh, Deborah mentioned earlier. Um, in the Making Citizens Project, we built our approach on four design principles drawn from recent civic education research, that civic education should build on students' own experiences with civic life, provide opportunities for them to discuss key controversies, build their skills of discussion, analysis, critique, and research, and build their knowledge of rights and responsibilities as citizens in a way that connects directly to their own concerns. Our redesign began with a reorganization of the year's curriculum so that students and teachers could easily access enduring questions that would allow them to explore historical content, relate the subject to their own lives, and reach today right away. Working with a historian and drawing upon the understanding uh, by design approach of Wiggins and McTee, uh, the team rethought how to approach historical content, collaboratively organizing the required content into themes with an overarching question and underlying essential questions. We also worked to build lasting pedagogical change uh, in civic education in, uh, into the model, developing four strands drawn from the literature on best practices in civic education, weaving discussion, writing, and expression, action research, and current events throughout the year. A focus on questions of equality, that's really hard to read, I'm sorry, um, and social justice were central, particularly in the social change theme displayed here. You can also see the forest, big questions about social change, the trees, so the key movements, the units, and the twigs, events, people and terms uh, 
in this, uh, in this table. Uh, and at the school with the closest ad adherence to the design principles, 100% of the students reported that they had talked about racism, sexism, and discrimination in class, that they had had class discussions in which they could freely offer their opinions, that they had learned about people who worked to make society better, that they had learned about things in society that needed to be changed, that they had learned about problems in society and what caused them, they had talked about current events. The qualitative data give a more intimate view of how the students experienced the new approach. The really big one was, what is an American? You know, that was the basis of the course. It's a big question, what makes an American, shared Vincent, a high school junior. In diverse Allwood High School, with students whose families had recently come to the United States from dozens of different countries, immigration was a vivid part of the community context. Questions related to immigration had the potential to be a bridge between the civic and the personal. In an end of the year interview, a student, Vinny, when asked if he could recall a particularly interesting discussion they'd had in class, answered, we had a class discussion on immigration. I have two parents that are immigrants, you know. It's something that, it's personal, it's personal. And you know, just hearing out the arguments, just understanding what my parents went through. With this framing, Allwood students easily connected the historical study of immigration to current and personally significant issues. The teacher described how her students probed their own feelings about immigration during class activities and discussions, directly engaging with each other on the topic, with students whose families had immigrated legally saying, I'm an immigrant, I came here legally, I don't think that illegal immigrants should get amnesty or certain benefits and they should go through the process like everyone else, and undocumented immigrant students explaining, in my home country, this is the way things are, and we had to get here any way we could, and we contribute to the economy, we contribute to society. Wayne Journal points out that it's typical to teach about immigration without teaching about historical and current acts of xenophobia and discrimination. In state standards for US history, immigration is set as a past event, something that occurred in distinct periods of American history, rather than a fluid process that continues today. Immigration in state standards is stranded in the 19th century and doesn't touch contemporary events. The curricular reform in this case provided space for students to make connections between historical content, contemporary concerns, and their own lives throughout the year. This approach to structuring content allows for immigration and other issues to be living issues that connect past to present in ways that we've been discussing, illuminating connections, interrogating structures, and providing opportunities for students to connect contemporary events to their own lives and to understand them more deeply. So finally, Recon, uh, recreating content. And on the same topic, immigration, I want to offer my final thoughts on the possibility of students recreating content through inquiry. In another line of research, I work in various ways with youth participatory action research uh, program. In these, uh, in these projects, which over the past nine years our student teachers have led uh, as after-school clubs in the semester following their student teaching experience, young people select issues of concern to them, conduct original research, and share their work with family uh, and teachers and the Rutgers community. In this example, students at an urban majority Latino elementary school in 2017, upset about the national conversation on immigration, decided to investigate feelings about immigration among their peers and families. And, and these are the student slides, so I'll pause briefly on each one uh, as I go through them. So they conducted surveys and interviews, and like I said, came to Rutgers to report their findings. They interviewed parents as part of the project, writing interview questions, taking notes, translating. They created charts to represent their data and they focused on feelings and concerns. They created other ways of representing the data. This wordle gives a visual depiction of the feelings of immigrants in this particular community, New Brunswick, New Jersey. Uh, look how long la large language looms and the sadness, fear, and worry expressed by the immigrants. They also asked the students that asked about what immigrants' hopes were in coming to the U.S. And again, you get a different feeling from this graphic depiction. 
the desire to better their lives, seeking new opportunities, commitment to family, strong belief in education. Through their research, the students learned firsthand about the sacrifices made by the immigrants in their communities, including their family members, learning about the strength and resilience of their community. And they heard the stories of community members and then represented them as data that they thought the rest of us should know, should understand. And finally, the student's work shows us how the current immigration climate is impacting this community, uh, immigrants who feel personally affected and with particular worries uh, about, and this is from 2017, so I can only imagine that these worries have been amplified. So, and I, I have more examples, but I won't do them now. So, uh, Elizabeth Moji suggests that social justice pedagogies that provide opportunities to question, challenge, and reconstruct knowledge are essential for equity in urban settings, school settings, and I would add in all settings. So I'll return to our central questions and a third that I was asked to address as well. How does knowing content matter for, disru for disrupting oppression? What's the relationship between advancing justice and the teaching of content? How can we support beginning teachers to learn content in ways that are intermeshed with the imperative to use teaching to disrupt racism? And I, I wanna open it, this up for discussion with these questions as prompts, but I'll try to pull it together just very briefly here. Uh, social studies is always political. How it is selected, structured, and presented, uh, or social studies content, right, is always political. How it's selected, structured, and presented always embodies and communicates a particular message, even if the designers are consciously trying to avoid such a message. Social studies content is the result of historical, social, and political forces and must be unpacked and connected to larger structures to understand, to be fully understood. Content in the social studies has been and continues to be deeply enmeshed with oppression. It surrounds us beyond school and shapes how we think about ourselves, others, and our country. And social studies teachers need to be supported with education, time, resources, and coaching to learn how to structure social studies content to reach its potential to create transformative educational experiences that help young people contextualize their own experiences and the pressing civic issues and injustices they see around them. This means figuring out which content most productively engages kids in consideration of fundamental and meaningful civic questions that connect past to present and designing an engaging student-centered curriculum around that. It also means learning how to provide opportunities for kids to recreate content, to ask their own questions, and find their own answers about the questions that concern them. So with that, I will end, and I look forward to hearing uh, questions or thoughts that came out of this. I do on this last slide have some resources. I guess the, the, this is gonna be up online, so, so, you can, so I can go back to the questions. Um, but thank you. or weigh in. Hi, my name is Aixa. So Hi. something I've been thinking about this whole time is time. Mm. So one, if um, we're not taught social studies well, and then we want to become social studies teachers in a teacher education program, how, how do you have enough time to one, you know, re, un, like relearn yeah. or unlearn and then, you know, how to have these types of discussions right. within the classroom. Isn't that the truth? Yeah, <laughs> no, absolutely. Um, and I think that's even more pressing, I suspect, in elementary. Um, secondary social studies teachers tend to be history majors and they've, uh, you know, increasingly getting more critical from their, from their um, you know, undergraduate uh, majors, getting a more critical approach. And you can pull on the ways that history is taught now in university for people to understand how themes are powerful and questions are powerful and how historians don't uh, just sort of tell things that they see, but it's all interpretive. You know, those, those students, most of them come in with, 
familiarity with that idea, but for elementary school teachers who probably were not history majors, right, maybe just, maybe haven't had social studies since high school, right, this is a really pressing issue. And I know at Rutgers we have one elementary social studies course that students take. I don't know, I don't know what you all do here. Um, and I think it's a real puzzle. I taught that course once and um, it was really daunting because you're supposed to cover kindergarten through, you know, fifth grade, how to teach social studies and folks have, you know, very glancing familiarity with the topic. Um, there are people, really good people working in that area and if you're really particularly interested in elementary, I know um, like Sarah Shear at Penn State Altoona does some really interesting work. Um, I think, you know, creating potentially um, some accompanying coursework, even one course that focuses on a critical um, uh, perspective on U.S. history would probably be pretty useful for um, for social studies teachers. I would rather have it be world history, but you know, to be honest, as you saw, U.S. is taught over and over and over again, and so that's that's what's really pertinent. Yes, but uh, you know, I think as teacher educators, we have to be creative and figure out ways to um, to get that deep engagement and critical approach in there. And then also just really, I mean, uh, you know, on the one hand, everything you say is really true. But on the on the other hand, there's so many resources available now, at least you know, um, and so many really excellent um, sources for um, interesting curricula. So. I think part of our job as teacher educators is to help people learn how to um, access and work with those materials rather than having them, you know, create things from scratch. But yeah, no, that's a that's a very important question. Hello. Hey. I'm Josie. Um, fabulous talk. Thank you. So my question is on the stuff that comes after the young people are like. Mm. exposed to the content so like thinking of the emotional reactions and like how many different ways that can go anger sadness um, frustration um, and then the action part because mm -hmm. you know maybe you know young people are learning about this like what can I do about mm. this um, especially this is so relevant in their lives so I'm curious right. in your experience what have young people said what have, what have they um, done in response to learning about this content specifically about racism xenophobia or in your experience with collaborators, you know, what are some of those contextual supports that you have right. provided to mm -hmm. um, work with the emotional and mm -hmm. behavioral responses to mm -hmm. it? I mean, from what I've seen, the more young people learn, uh, you know, engage with this kind of curriculum, critical curriculum, the more they want. <laughs> I was in a class the other day with a teacher who teaches a, um, a race and inequality course at the high school level. And um, uh, she also runs the after school youth action research program and, and her students were saying, everybody should take your course. Everybody needs to have this stuff. You know, they're pretty, um, uh, you know, kind of uh, impassioned about how what they're learning needs to be more generally understood. Um, but I think, you know, I think that's why I've kind of toggled back and forth between this curricular work with teachers and then action research work because it does lend itself to thinking about action. Young people, you know, do uh, want to work towards change and they're learning about injustice and social change movements. Um, and, um, you know, I think schools um, provide various opportunities for kids to engage in that kind of work, but, but not enough. I mean, in my own work, uh, I've worked with um, you know teachers who are running after school clubs and provide a space for them to come together and talk about the issues that the kids are bringing up and I can do it more directly with our student teachers when they're leading the um, action research programs but um, yeah I mean it takes ongoing discussion ongoing you know bringing in things that happen in class bringing in um, thorny issues that student teachers need to work through and talk about and troubleshoot uh, all of that but it's you know uh, I think it's, with all its problems, it's still better than, you know, just kind of papering over history. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. 
Hey. Uh, my name is Channing. Hi. Um, thank you so much for your talk. So what I was thinking about mm -hmm. is when, um, so you know, on one end, we could think about this content as, or some will think about this content as creating agitators mm -hmm. or creating like rabble rousers and disruptors. And I thought it was, it was pretty salient when you were um, going through your talk and saying that, oh, in, in addition to curriculum like this, the state was requiring that you need to have a respect for authority section. Right. Right. Um, but then there's also this tension of like te we know that teaching kids about s social inequalities and making them more aware of them helps them to do better in school because they're like, OK, they might be using education as a tool to fight against it or things like that. So how do we help mm -hmm. teachers who are in situations where they've got an administration that's saying that's saying, well, you're teaching them to be disrespectful to us and question everything that we do. And, but also recognizing that teaching students this way is helping them to do better in school. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, that they can always talk about the incredible skills that students are learning through doing this kind of work. Uh, you know, critical reading, analysis, expression, uh, doing original research. Those are all, you know, people talk about college ready, right? College and career ready skills. Um, you know, I get asked a lot, well, what is it, you know, how should we be preparing students for the university? How do we change our, our high school classes so it really, you know, prepares them for what they're gonna encounter? This, the, the kind of work that I've been talking about is really, I mean, like you said, that, that's what's gonna lead them to being able to engage deeply with, um, with anything that they encounter and deeply and articulately and, and be able to do research uh, and express themselves. So I think that that, um, I think, you know, school administrators even, and parents and, you know, can understand that the value of that. But yeah, I, I, you know, that's a big, that's an issue. And we were talking at lunch about, um, who was talking about the kid, uh, kids coming in to talk about Colin Kaepernick and the teacher said, yeah, yeah. So the, and the teacher, um, said, you know, we're not going to talk about that. Right. So, there, yeah, uh, and there's an unfortunate tendency to, you know, kind of assume for some reason that school's not a space where you're supposed to talk about that. Um, whereas, you know, for me as a teacher, you know, somebody brings in something that they care about, you know, what could be better? Um, so, yeah, thank, thank you. you. Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Paulina. Thank you again for your talk. Um, so I really appreciate this because I do a lot of work, um, well, emerging work, with uh, textbook representation, mm. and especially with historically marginalized um, groups. Mm. And so I'm specifically interested in kind of this separation that has started to happen specifically with the West Coast and the mm -hmm. formula they're kind of forming uh, the ethnic studies pedagogy, right. especially in California, Washington, Oregon. And so what I have heard some of the narratives being is that now there's this um, ethnic studies that has kind of risen because social studies has lacked to really uh, mm -hmm. acknowledge and respect a lot of the different perspectives that there mm -hmm. are. And so because of that, ethnic studies has um, kind of just been created and cultivated. Um, but my question right. would be, um, with social studies as it stands, are we supposed to accept that this is the mainstream narrative that we are working with and we therefore as educators are supposed to continue to disrupt that or are we working to disrupt how social studies is being presented? Um, because I'm interested in ways to merge how ethnic studies and social studies can kind of be a thing yeah. instead of having to separate them. And so that's kind of what my work has been. I've been feeling tension around that. Yeah. So I'm just curious what you would think about that in terms of all of your work with social studies content. Yeah, I mean, that's really interesting. I think uh, I mentioned, I think it was Brands Branscom and Chandler talk about white social studies, right? And it seems like what you're talking about is like, we're sort of like, okay, we'll, we'll leave that white social studies alone, but then we'll create another social studies to deal with marginalized voices. I mean, I, I'm all for ethnic studies courses, but I don't think we should have a white social studies. Um, I mean, it's this perpetuating the same dynamic that, you know, that we were, or that I was talking about earlier that we want to avoid. Um, and I mean, historians, engage with multiple perspectives in their work and continually reassess and look back at the past and, uh, you know, interrogate it. And, you know, I th that's what we should be doing in our social studies classes as well. Yeah. Mark 
Kluber. Um, Hi. Thank you for that. It, I, this is not an area I work in, and I apologize for the naivete. Um, but I, there was the quote about hist um, I don't remember the, the curriculum being memory and mm. brown and brown. And mm. I find it very powerful. In yeah. Saying that that's shapes uh, identity, shapes um, national identity, but um, more broadly. Yeah. Uh, my impression from the outside is that the curriculum work, though, in, in social studies has become sort of, I mean, it probably always is to some degree, but it's become a very pointed sort of ideological um, battleground. Um, mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering uh, whether you've thought about ways in which, ways of working on a curriculum for adults mm. who have been educated in education. <laughs> begin to open up a space around positive um, positive white identity, positive American identity that, that, that thinks of those people as the students. Hmm. Um, it's a, and I, I, I don't know, it's a space that I continue to puzzle about. I, 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 I feel a little as though we need to make some progress. And that might be a strategy to, to open the conversation up. Um, I guess there are two aspects of the question that I have and whether you've thought about. One is um, there's, a, there's a kind of work in this space which is about getting the acknowledgement for a whole bunch of stuff which hasn't been. But then there's also a bunch of work that needs to be done to build, to build out from what is positive from what was there that, that people can be, can, that, that otherwise might be defensive and fragile in, in lots of ways can hold on to and begin to see themselves in. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So there's that sort of work. And then there's the, this other sort of work, which is um, how can this field um, begin to help us in a prob broader sort of public yeah. discourse of re-educating ourselves mm -hmm. and our sense of who we are. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think there's a lot that's inspiring, you know, in the national, you know, story that can be woven into the kinds of critical engagements that, that we're talking about, you know. Um, I, I, I always think about that, the, the little bit of the conversation that I shared with you, um, the Socratic seminar and the Pledge of Allegiance, which was just this amazing uh, experience for me because these kids, they would not stop talking, you know, and I have this long, long transcript. I use it in various ways. I use it when I teach about collecting data and I use it in, you know, in workshops on civic identity and teaching all kinds of things. But, um, you know, the, the kids were, they didn't have one way of thinking about the Pledge of Allegiance. They had a lot of really complicated, um, you know, thoughtful ideas uh, and they were arguing with each other about, you know, is it, wh what's the value of, you know, they were, some of them were advocating for a pledge to liberty and justice, which is the ideal of the country. And if you don't have that, then we have nothing to believe in and what's the point? And others were critiquing that approach. I think there's a lot of room for discussion of those ideas. And I think that um, those discussions really excite people and get them engaged and get them thinking. And, and for me, that's the, you know, that's the objective, not conveying a particular version of the past. Thank you so much for this. It's very, um, very useful to think on all the levels that you're hearing from the questioners. So I wanted to, um, think a little bit about this question of curriculum and the construction of curriculum as a lever for change. I mm. think I may have heard you, I, I want to check, hoping that the construction of curriculum could give teachers tools to reconstruct what they're doing, how they're doing, or what they think their purposes are. So I guess I have to check. Are you partly thinking? Say that again? The mm. curriculum material and mm. reconstructed curriculum can be a lever for changing some of what you've showed us. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> well, my question is, is a person who's worked more in a, in a field in which that hope persists for <laughs> generations and never seems to, I mean, what we've learned <laughs> in mathematics is that teachers, because of what I think Aixa said and others have said, grow up with their own right. stories about whatever it is they're teaching and about their young people and about the purposes of schooling and about this society. They inherit all of that and bring it with them. Right. And at least in the field that I know something about, it's not really achieved things that people persist in thinking it can do, but yet, reformers and others who activists hope that that can do that. And I'm wondering if social studies might be different or what you mm. know about mm. 
whether and how social studies curriculum has served as a powerful force for disruption. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. What do you know about that so far? Or do you, I mean, these fields aren't all the same, maybe, so I don't know. Mm -hmm. I'm curious what you know about that or what you've seen. Um, I think that, um, I think engaging deeply with curriculum um, you know, is a lever for change. I don't think handing people a curriculum is necessarily a lever for anything. Um, so it's hard because, you know, obviously you want to provide resources and you can't, as a number of people said, you know, if you were educated in a particular way, how in the world are you supposed to envision something different? But I think in a way it's, it's, all, it's so important to give people those, those educational experiences, not just the curriculum itself, but to fully engage them in the kinds of thinking that we want them to be doing in their classrooms eventually. Um, so, I mean, and I'm sure your methods classes do this as well, you know, the, our methods classes are really structured around um, leading students through the kinds of activities that they would do with young people. Um, but I think, you know, uh, I think someone raised this question. I mean, the content is deep, and if you don't have much of a grounding, then it's hard to create meaningful, deep experience, learning experience for students. And sometimes when people are, um, don't feel comfortable, they get, they have a very, um, you know, by the book uh, approach to enacting the curriculum, and then that itself uh, can, you know, results in a stilted, kind of inauthentic experience. Because a lot of this is about, being able to respond to what kids bring to the classroom and help them connect the dots, um, and um, and that's not going to be in a in a curriculum. But on the other hand, there are really amazing materials so um, that do provide um, both content and and pedagogy um, for for uh, teachers getting started with them. So I think maybe a, a like a an intersection where we explicitly work with teachers. Uh, with the curricular resources and talk about them and use them ourselves and try to develop, uh, you know, not a by the book approach, but a more kind of authentic um, approach to, to using that. You know. appreciated learning today a little bit about the work that you, you do with pre-service teachers mm -hmm. and also um, more experienced teachers. And I'm wondering um, if you've thought about a, or how you think about um, a teacher's sort of journey mm -hmm. of learning um, to be a critical social yeah. studies teacher um, from the beginning you know, and on and what kinds of um, social studies lessons or tasks that teachers do um, are most sort of appropriate for a beginner and how that um, journey might sort of grow over mm. time. Um. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think all the, you know, everything we want social studies teachers to be able to do, you know, they get better at over time, um, leading discussions, uh, leading kids in student-centered activities, um, teaching kids about writing and research, uh, you know, engaging them in analysis of, of historical documents and content. Um, uh, you know, as, as teachers are at it for a while, they can add new things without being so overwhelmed. Uh, you know, and at the beginning, if you're, when you're creating everything, it's very, you know, it, it's very overwhelming. Um, I mean, I, don't, I, I do some professional development, but mostly I'm working with pre-service teachers or in my research with kids um, and working with teachers who are really bought into the idea of youth action research and so just kind of wanting to collaborate on that. Um, I mean, I have found, I guess, one experience that might speak to that is um, in the Making Citizens book where I worked with the teachers to reconstruct the curriculum. They were all really excited to, they were all f around in, in their like fifth or sixth year of teaching, and they all felt like it was a perfect time for them to really sit down and dig into the curriculum and think about it and restructure it in a way that uh, made sense to them. They had a lot to draw on, a lot of experience. You know, this, when I teach about this, it doesn't make sense to kids. I think it would make a lot more sense if we, you know, put it, put it together with this other piece of content. You know, so really having a, a feel for what worked in the classroom. So I guess I could imagine, you know, a trajectory where after a few years, you really had a chance to then dig in and do some curriculum work and um, and some structuring work, um, 
to address issues that you've seen come up uh, in your in your first years of practice. Again, thank you so much. Um, so one quick thought, mm -hmm. uh, you opened up and we, we had a letter that the parents wrote to the principal yeah. of the school. Yeah. And so that made me think about mm. um, school leadership yeah. and school culture yeah. and how have you seen that really mm. play, play an impact mm -hmm. on uh, this type of thinking sure. around delivery of curriculum in ways that are quite liberatory and critical yeah. for students. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I'm sure many of you have seen it as well. It, you know, it can be night and day in different schools. Uh, and what in one school they wouldn't dream of doing, in other schools they encourage. Um, so, I mean, recently I was saying this at lunch, um, you know, I've seen much more openness to um, getting kids involved in um, action research projects to making the, the curriculum more relevant, more critical um, in the schools that I've been working with. You know, I always wonder whether social studies teachers' fears about teaching things that are too political, I just wonder how real those are, you know, and how much is just a sense of discomfort with that material. Because I really do feel like there's, there are so many ways of doing it that, um, uh, don't take a political position per se, a, you know, electoral kind of political position, and that really are uh, can be very easily justified as what we were talking about before, as you know, deep learning and college preparation and all of that. Um, so, so yeah, I think you know, it, 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 from the top can be very helpful if the principal and the administration are supportive of those efforts. If they want to see that kind of work going on in school, that then empowers teachers to to do it. Um, and uh, conversely, I have, I have talked to principals who say they want their teachers to be doing this kind of work and they can't get them to, so, you know. So, um, you talked about uh, racial pedagogical knowledge mm -hmm. and, you know, many of your examples illuminated huge chasms and the lack of that <laughs> racial pedagogical knowledge um, while at the same time you have this letter from a parent that really evokes incredible racial literacy. And so I'm wondering, given like yeah. the incredible, the dearth of this, um, the really like the violence that that does to kids and communities, um, what are some ways that you've seen in your work that um, have been successful in developing that kind of racial pedagogical knowledge mm -hmm. in candidates mm -hmm. and then in sustaining it in ways that, um, that are, are useful mm -hmm. in the way that, that teachers are teaching? Mm -hmm. Well, the, I mean, that really, I mean, the, 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 the parents, you know, that I, the parents, I had three different parents' responses in this talk, actually, and, you know, that really um, struck me as I was preparing this that, um, you know, the parents were like, yeah, this is what's going on. And they were, you know, completely on point with it. Um, and so that's something I want to think about a lot more. Um, but in terms of working with candidates, I mean, you know, we have um, uh, coursework. I mean, that's what we do, right? We have coursework. Uh, and students go to classes and then they come back and they talk about it and they reflect about it and we, you know, engage and interrogate and do all that. Um, and sometimes it works and people, you know, talk about revelations and sometimes people are really resistant. Um, you know, I think a combination of, of um, you know, reading critical pieces, but then also hearing people's experiences. I mean, that is just, there's no substitute for, you know, a integrated diverse classroom where people speak about what they've experienced and um, folks who have not understood uh, what it means to, uh, you know, not be privileged in society finally get it. Um, so that's not, you know, that's like a bit of social engineering that you can't always make happen. Um, but, but I've seen that, those experiences be really powerful. And reading case studies, 
I mean, that's when I do use a lot of, you know, data from my research to bring it into the classroom so, um, so students can, you know, read students' words and see classroom discussions and, you know, just kind of seeing it in action, you know, I think are more, more powerful than telling people. Uh, my name is Naomi. So I've been thinking, I think what struck me the most um, in your talk was uh, highlighting the video from the parent mm. who was going through the history textbook. Mm -hmm. And I loved how she said, you know, all these people with these little PhDs behind their names, <laughs> right? <laughs> and so I guess I'm engaging or thinking, I think more I'm just like voicing out my musings about, thank you, Simona, for that word, um, about how we're talking about teaching teachers, mm -hmm. but also thinking about our colleagues, right? So all those folks with PhDs by yeah. the names and endorse this, you know, textbook. And then at the same time, I think I'm also simultaneously thinking about this push of um, contesting uh, ethnic studies. And one argument is that, um, you know, it's pushing hatred for America or hatred for white people, or um, as we said, um, it's pushing against uh, respecting authority, mm. right? And so mm. I'm wondering how all mm. these are like connecting with one another because we're talking about teaching teachers, but we're also talking about colleagues and, and how we endorse certain schools of thought that are really just perpetuating and pushing the isms that you, know, you were discussing. Yeah. So I wondered like your thoughts on that. Yeah, and you know, because we you know, don't have a national curriculum, it really differs from state to state. So I mean, that was so many examples come from Texas. Uh, <laughs> you know, I would not want to be teaching social studies in Texas, really, you know, because those are the materials that you're given. New Jersey, you know, it's, it's, it's a little better, although, of course, that's where my other example came from. So, um, uh, but yeah, I think, you know, that's a really, you know, that's a really salient point. Um, yeah, the, uh, sorry, I lost the thread of, uh, of the question again. <laughs> oh, dealing with the, the, yeah, the, the kind of context surrounding uh, the content that's taught. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it, it, you know, it's really difficult in some places to do this kind of work. Um, although, I mean, a lot of the most exciting stuff was done, has been done in Arizona and, you know, where they create these alternate spaces and then they get the political pushback and then, they, you know, it's kind of a back and forth. Um, you know, but we're really regionalized in that way. And I didn't really understand the stuff in the South until I started really looking into it and, and the pervasiveness of, you know, this basically kind of co-curriculum, co-confederate curriculum. So I think every region is going to have um, its own particularities to delve into. And it, it is, I think, really important for um, uh, teacher education programs to think about where they're located and what kind of schools their students are going to be teaching in. So, you know, in New Jersey, you know, we have a particular set of issues that we really dig into about, you know, who their students are and what, the, you know, the, the state uh, wants from us and, and all of that. So, uh, you know, helping teachers uh, see themselves as professionals in relation to all those different forces and as people who can actually make decisions and, um, and uh, you know, evaluate whether they're going to use something or not. Right, the teacher didn't have to use that textbook, for example, so. I'm gonna read you a question I just got by email. Um, I'd love to hear more <laughs> about your experience of and thoughts on YPAR in social studies. What kinds of content do students surface in their work? Mm -hmm. How do teachers structure it in order to ensure that they are grappling with the enduring themes of social studies and tying past to present. Yeah. I mean, YPAR, so, so the example I gave was actually from an after school club, not from a, a YPAR that happened during the school day. I was talking about this a little bit earlier. I have worked with teachers integrating it into their school day, um, into their US history classroom in particular. Uh, and they haven't really, I haven't seen it done really in a way that kind of integrates with the content of the social studies classroom. It's more of a, okay, on Fridays, we're going to work on our action research project. So it's kind of a parallel track. Um, I could imagine 
doing that, although, you know, you risk the, the you know, I mean, this seems to be what happens with the social studies is that we're, we try to make everything mesh with everything else, you know, and then we end up with these giant grids, you know, where it's all supposed to work in a line, and we look at it and we're like, oh, yes, it works, it's great, and then a teacher's like, what am I supposed to do with this? Um, so, um, you know, I, I think that action research can really be part of a, of a curriculum, but I wouldn't, you know, force it into, um, you know, to do content related work that it isn't, because part of the thing, and this is always the question when you start these projects, to what extent are kids going to pick a project? And, you know, I mean, really, the young people have to choose what their topic is. So if they decide they want to investigate school lunches, you know, and you're teaching U.S. history, you know, it's going to be a little hard to, to you know, marry that with your curriculum. But if you're committed to doing the action research, it can go along, it can be a piece of your social studies curriculum. Hi. My name Hi. Is Harper. Thanks for being here with us today. This is really cool. Um, my question would be, when we think about working with students at any age, we sort of have to grapple with the idea that these kids are, or adults, are growing up in a country that is permeated by, by white supremacy and these like white social studies narratives that you've mm -hmm. talked about. And that sort of raises the risk that uh, our students are going to offer us answers that we find mm. reprehensible. Mm. And I'm, I'm curious mm. as a teacher mm -hmm. um, and as a teacher educator how you've dealt with students who provide you with responses that you find morally repugnant. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's a tough one. <laughs> and I think I've been really fortunate, <laughs> I guess. May, I don't know. It probably would have been good for me to have more of that. Um, but, you know, it, you know, I've been in spaces that haven't had too much of that. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think that's where it's really important to have relationships with your students, first and foremost, and to cultivate relationships in your classroom to, ha to have some sort of a um, kind of ground level of um, uh, collegiality and um, respect for each other in the room. Um, so knowing your students and, and you know, um, having that personal relationship, you know, can allow you to say things that they may not want to hear so much. Um, but, you know, I think there's the, um, sort of teacherly response, right? Is there another way to look at this? Can any, does anybody, you know, uh, have another way that somebody might look at this particular situation? Or what would you say, you know, if this happened, right? I mean, we can't get into a, I don't think we want our classrooms to be places where we're trying to make everybody think one way. Um, I don't think that's possible. And it's certainly, I don't think it's, you know, really, um, you know, a useful way to go into teaching. I really do think about classrooms as spaces where people get the opportunity to, to um, challenge themselves and each other and to grow, not to learn one way of thinking. Um, and, uh, but I think also, I mean, when you talk about morally repugnant, I mean, then, you know, you have to think about what's allowable and not allowable in the classroom. And those are things that also can be talked about with your class at the beginning, um, you know, what uh, uh, what do we do if somebody voices something that's hurtful or that that um, that we think isn't acceptable in this space, and um, and talking through that uh, with the class, and we do that in the youth action research clubs as well. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, it's that's a that's you know, if you're talking about things that are uh, that touch people, you know, you get those kinds of you get people's emotional responses, for sure. Mm -hmm. Hey. Yes. Um, I have been trying to listen for the kinds of things you're mentioning as sort of knowledge and skills mm -hmm. and orientations that teachers who are disruptors in social studies spaces have and some of the examples. Mm -hmm. I just want to mm -hmm. share some things I'm hearing and kind of check with you if that sounds right to you and see what you would add because I'm sure there's so much and it's certainly part of the larger endeavor of preparing teachers. What do we, it goes back to the Dina's question about how do we prioritize, mm -hmm. what do we prioritize? But I'm hearing things like racial literacy and racial pedagogical co content knowledge. I'm also hearing things like, you know, analyzing sources and research and 
asking questions mm -hmm. or critiquing and making arguments and things like that. And um, that, in terms of a classroom space, sounds like leading discussion. Leading discussion. Maybe, mm -hmm. um, maybe students are working in small groups. Mm -hmm. You just mentioned mm -hmm. family or student relationships. Mm -hmm. Classrooms have big family relationships as well. Mm -hmm. So there's some mix of like awarenesses and understanding plus practice plus knowledge of you know what is the actual what is u.s history it's not this neat story that is often presented mm -hmm. um are there things you would add like what would what, what do you think is, is that in line with oh absolutely thinking, absolutely what else would you say I'm really well i mean i think you're exactly right i mean it's like structuring you know uh structuring learning right and all that it, it encompasses including how people are interacting with each other and with the material uh that they're engaging with uh, I mean, I focused a lot on discussion and various forms of discussion um, and um, uh, expression um, and, and kind of uh, projects that ask students to, um, uh, to dig into a topic and um, do original research and take their own stand on it. Um, I mean, what else is there? I mean, you know, doing um, group worthy, you know, group worthy tasks, right? So not using group work, but not for the sake of group work, you know, not having a worksheet oriented group work, but actually giving students um, activities or projects that you need four people to accomplish or five people to accomplish. So, uh, I mean, you know, that's central to, uh, to the methods that I think are useful for getting to kids to engage in this kind of work. Um, you know, close reading and, and all of those kinds of skills that, that we talk about a lot in social studies, you know. But connected, you know, I think, connect, I mean, for me the important thing is connected to purpose, connected to some meaningful question or theme, you know. Sure. Middle school teacher. Yay. Um, and I keep going over and over in my head. Uh, I teach ne next year. I'll teach uh, uh, the American history mm. curriculum, and I want to kind of continue the question that you had. Mm. Um, and and a, apart from students bringing it up, this other perspective, I find that um, that's one of the most challenging parts of teaching American history from Revolution to Civil War is the perspective piece mm. and to accurately por portray such different perspectives without first-hand accounts that are very readable and understandable. And, um, and if we go uh, the route um, that we're kind of taking with this discussion and um, we don't tend to bring up the perspective of the oppressors in the case, how would you advise to bring it up because I think it's easy to dismiss it so if I, in my head I was thinking um, the confederate statues that exist now mm -hmm. in the discussion we're having as a country mm -hmm. and sort of the argument of people hanging on to that heritage piece and to dismiss that is easy and to say well it's just wrong but then without understanding that perspective I think we're we're not seeing the big picture either so when you do talk about certain groups in history that tend to have gotten most of the, uh, the attention in their Eurocentric curriculum, and kids aren't bringing it up, do you suggest we still bring it up in, in a way that this is what they were thinking, this is what they were feeling, these were their um, rationales and viewpoints for doing these things that mm. seem to be oppressive, but hmm. how, do you, how do you think we enter that conversation? Yeah, you know, um, so Lowen has this really great book called Lies Across America. <laughs> Have you? Seen, I don't know if you've seen it, um, where he looks at monuments and he digs into the real history behind all these different historical markers. And, I, you know, I think like that kind of deep exploration of a particular, a really concrete manifestation, you know, a historical symbol could be really useful, you know, a useful way into that conversation for kids, you know. So why is this here, right? And I mean, what strikes me about the Confederate monuments is that most of them were not, they didn't get raised during the Civil War or immediately after, right? They came, you know, during Jim Crow. So what's the context here? Where Where's this coming from? What's the intention here? Um, I don't, you know, um, 
Yeah, middle school is interesting, uh, <laughs> you know, and I, I tend to think about things that are, you know, more visual and hands-on and, you know, that kids can kind of get a lot out of looking at one piece of evidence or one, one a marker or, a, a, you know, a site and really digging into it and then maybe, you know, maybe in pairs and then presenting it with each other, you know, so what's the thinking that went behind creating this particular, I mean, the marker that I put up before, right, that, um, that whatever, that marble marker. Um, from that Confederate museum. Uh, I could imagine an assignment where a couple of kids would dig into it, would analyze it, um, would talk about who's involved and how it came to be, and then present it to each other and, um, you know, with some sort of question to pull it together at the end. Why do we memorialize things in particular ways? What does it mean? What should we do? What should we do about it? This is an open question, right, and that we're all arguing about, you know. So I think it's a perfectly appropriate one to talk about with kids. Yeah. And now, actually, five minutes ago, oh, is right. when I have to do the thing that I really Michigan has doing, questions which is now. To mm -hmm. call us to a close, even though I think there's still so many questions bubbling up in this room, and my colleagues and friends are nodding their heads. But the lovely part of ending is that your paper is forthcoming yes. and will continue to engage us in thinking and stretching us, um, but I am so grateful for all that you've given to us today. I'm grateful that you've taken our questions so very seriously, that you thought about it while you were running and <laughs> teaching, and, um, and it's really um, stretched us, and, and so for that, I'm really, truly grateful. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. All right, well. Feel free to email me if you have any thoughts or questions or examples of curriculum that we should think about.